Can I say that? Joe Biden went to Pennsylvania. He wants to win that state. He needs to win that state. And of course, he's from Scranton. So he went to Pennsylvania to meet with the regular folk. Of course, the only reason he went there was because he was getting a big money endorsement from union bosses. The steel union workers decided to give him an endorsement. It was a big moment for him. The mayor and I are buddies. I told the mayor, and I mean it sincerely, the first outfit ever to endorse me as a 29-year-old kid running in a tough year for United States Senate, make me the second youngest man ever elected to the Senate, was a guy named Huey Carcella. And back in those days, we had a big steel workers. We had a lot of steel workers in Claymont, Delaware, where I was from, because they worked in Worth Steel Company. And, uh, and I'll never forget coming to me and saying, we're going to get your help. And I came out to Pittsburgh, and, and steel workers endorsed me. It changed everything. Changed everything. Yeah, it's a great story. You know, listen, we used to have a lot of steel factories in Delaware. That, of course, until I got elected. And then me and my party, we ruined the economy for the manufacturing base. And now it's all credit card services and banking and insurance. And you steel workers can go fly a kite. Doesn't matter. But but ah, I love you guys. Love you guys. But it's, it's a sweet story. It is. Here he is getting the big U.S. steel workers endorsement. From big union bosses, the workers themselves don't like him, but the union bosses like him because he throws a lot of benefits their way and they're going to, you know, get out the vote and strong arm their membership and try to force them to vote against their will. But it's a warm and wonderful story. First union ever to endorse him for any elected office when he ran for Senate back in 1972. Isn't that great? Very sweet story. Too bad it's a complete and total lie. Because just a couple of months ago, he got this endorsement from the UAW, and he told them the exact same thing. Just want to let you know, I'm, I'm sitting here with uh, our entire international executive board, and uh, we wanted to call and let you know that we've met, and we decided it's time to endorse you for president, and we're going to put right. the UAW membership behind you. Whoa. <laughs> you are the first outfit out there endorsed me when I ran in 19... 19- 72 as a kid. You helped me out then. We so he's just a liar. It's the exact same story. He Does he think that we don't know this? Does he think that there aren't cameras running? He probably doesn't even remember that cameras have been invented, to be honest. So back in 1972, the UAW was the first union to ever endorse Joe Biden, except when the U.S. Steelworkers endorsed him. And then they were the first union to ever endorse Joe Biden in 1972. Then he took to the stage. And he had two different events. We're going to show you clips from both events because, well, they're hilarious and also terrifying that this man continues to keep the nuclear codes and can launch a war at any given time. One day I showed up at all your convention and I was in uh, I was in the motel after the local motel getting changed after the afternoon session, go back to the evening session. I'd come down with some young activist through a little older than me, but still young activists who uh, were uh, involved in trying to reform the party. <laughs> and uh, I was in one of those eight by 10 bathrooms, you know, they have shower, toilet in the sink. And I got a towel on me and shaving cream. And I hear bam, bam, bam at my door really loudly. And uh, I wonder what the hell is that? I thought it was this guy, Bob Cunningham on a radio show and a couple of the guys. So I said, okay, okay, guys. And I walked to the door and opened it up, and standing there was the former governor of the state of Delaware, Albert N. Carvel, a big guy, about 6'5", talked at you like he is. And the state representative who got defeated four years earlier as a Democratic state rep who was retired. And one of the, from the family that had more, more senators appointed than any other family in American history, to the tunnels, and the former retired justice. And the, and the state chairman. And they said, I'm standing in a towel and shaving cream on my face. Now, I would love to tell you exactly uh, what the point of that story was. With all the very vivid details about all of these cronies that he used to cozy up to, to stay in elected office. Because, you know, that's what Democrats do, especially in Delaware, one of the most corrupt states in our country with the most corrupt Democratic Party apparatus. You know, all the I love that he's bragging about all these cronies that he knows or knew because they're all dead by now. I would love to tell you the final point of the story 
why Joe Biden needed to ramble on and on and mumble, barely audible, to this audience of captives because they're forced to be there by their union bosses to hear how he greeted somebody at the door of a hotel room wearing nothing but a towel and shaving cream on his face. But there absolutely was no point. It never reached any sort of anything. This is just a rambling, incoherent man who, who I think thinks he's telling stories to the friends at the retirement home. But it got worse. Joe Biden... Joe Biden is the nephew of a man who was eaten by cannibals. That's, that's the headline we got yesterday. As Joe Biden began to tell stories about cannibals, he started on the tarmac uh, between one of his stops in Pennsylvania. Ambrose Finnegan, I'm going to call him Uncle Bozy, he, uh, he was shot down. He was in the Army Air Corps before there was an Air Force. He flew single engine planes, reconnaissance flights over New Guinea. He had volunteered because someone couldn't make it. He got shot down in an area where there were a lot of uh, cannibals in New Guinea at the time. They never recovered his body, but the government went back when I went down there and they checked and found some parts of the plane and the like. And what I was thinking about when I was standing there was. When Trump refused to go up to the memorial for veterans in Paris, and he said they're a bunch of suckers and losers. So he ends this vivid story about his uncle being eaten by cannibals in New Guinea with a lie about Donald Trump that has already been debunked multiple times about saying something that he never said about veterans. But let's just roll back for a second. So his his uncle, Uncle Bozy, is flying reconnaissance in New Guinea, gets shot down where there are cannibals, and they never recover the body, suggesting that Uncle Bozy was dinner that night for a bunch of natives in New Guinea. By the way, if you're Joe Biden's ambassador to New Guinea, what kind of job do you have to do today to clean up this freaking mess? I assure you, the president doesn't blame you for this, and he doesn't actually think that you people are cannibals. Now, strangely, like two hours later, he told the story again in Scranton. Why is he telling reporters on the tarmac in Scranton this story, by the way? Anyway, Joe, the reporters are already going to vote for you. Don't worry about it. They're already on your side. So then he goes, and now since you've already heard this story, he's going to tell it again. But I want you to watch the faces of the people who are literally forced against their will to stand up beside behind him and hold up a sign because it's painful to watch. Back in when D-Day occurred and on Sunday, the next day, my mother's four brothers all went down to the recruiting station and joined the military. Every one of them volunteered. And my Uncle, they called him Ambrose, they called him Bozy. My Uncle Bozy was a hell of an athlete, they tell me when he was a kid. And he became an Army Air Corps before the Air Force came along. He flew those single engine planes as reconnaissance over war zones. And he got shot down in New Guinea. And uh, they never found the body because there used to be there a lot of cannibals for real in that part of New Guinea. And, uh, and then my son volunteered to go to Iraq for a year, and he came back with stage four glioblastoma. And, and, they, and they gave, like many of you, risked your lives, and you know people who gave their lives to the country. They're heroes. But one of the things that I, as I was doing that today, I was reminded. Yeah, and then he goes on to tell the lie about Donald Trump, and it's, it's like, it's all they've got. It's all they've got. But he's got to frame it with this story, which, have we heard this before exactly? About Uncle Bozy, Finnegan Bozy, Finnegan. I like his name as Finnegan. Uh, and the fact that he was eaten by cannibals. You would think that that would be something we would have heard about by now. And now he's telling it to RNC counted three times, three times in a 24 hour period. Did he tell the story about his uncle shot down or crashed for some reason in New Guinea and then eaten by cannibals? Uh, can't be true, right? In fact, it is a lie. 
the military, the Defense Department at the time, the Secretary of War, they never said that he was eaten by cannibals in any way whatsoever. But of course, the media now, they're doing all of the hard work for him. Look at NBC News. God bless him. President Biden mischaracterizes the circumstances of his uncle's death. Mischaracterized it. He didn't lie. He's not lying. That's not a lie. He's merely mischaracterizing the circumstances of his uncle's death. Associated Press. Biden is off on the details of his uncle's World War II death. Yeah, he didn't lie. He was just off on the details, guys. As he just claimed that his uncle was eaten by cannibals. That's just a slight detail that he was off on. Come on. Give the man a break. Meanwhile, of course, he's trying to relate himself to Scranton because he always tells you he's from Scranton. He's the boy from Scranton. He was from Scranton. My mom lives in Scranton. My dad lives in Scranton. I live in Scranton. I'm from Scranton. And Scranton, Scranton, right? What about your mom in Scranton again? My mom didn't live in, in Scranton since she was 1954. Oh, well. Okay, her mom lived in Scranton, but only up until the point she was 1,954 years old. That's what he said. My mom lived in Scranton until she was 1954. My mom didn't live in, in Scranton since she was 1954. Since she was 1954. But that's all right. It doesn't matter because Scranton is in his blood. Scranton is in his DNA. Scranton is the very fiber of his being. He's all about Scranton, right? My grandfather would tell me when I walked out the door in North, Scranton, North, 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 Scranton, in North Washington Avenue in Scranton. Yeah, it's it's so natural for him to talk about Scranton that he can't even pronounce the word anymore. Well, because he's a senile old fart. Okay, then things got to because this would all be funny. And it is funny because we should laugh at this guy because he's going to get us all killed. But then he was asked a question about Israel. He was asked a question about Israel. And of course, he was met with protesters outside all screaming in favor of the Hamas terrorists, because that's his base. And then he said this about his efforts in diplomacy with Benjamin Netanyahu to make sure that the war didn't escalate. He wants to make sure that they don't move on Rafa, which is a city in Gaza. Here we go. And I made it clear to Israelis, don't move on Haifa. It's just not, I mean, anyway, I, I just... Look what we did recently when Israel. Don't move on Haifa, he says. Haifa is a city in Israel. It's part of Israel. It's it's not in Gaza. It's not in any Palestinian controlled territories. Haifa is actually, I think, the third largest city in Israel. And Joe Biden warned the Israelis not to move on Haifa. Warned them not to move on their own city. And I made it clear to Israelis, don't move on Haifa. I, by the way, I'm offended by the notion that this guy picks up the phone and calls Prime Minister Netanyahu and dares to warn him and make it clear to him that Netanyahu can't move on any city that he damn well pleases, assuming that he meant Rafa. But then you should be offended that he doesn't even know the basics do you think this is the stutter working again? Is that the problem? This is just the stutter. And I made it clear to Israelis, don't move on Haifa. It's just not, I mean, it, anyway, I, I just. We are so f Can I say that? You can bleep it later. This is the advantage of watching the live stream on Rumble. We're f And then there's this. Now, this is the end of his speech in Scranton. And we're going to show you what he does, but can you take a look at his face, please? Look at the dead eyes. You know, people always, he's always wearing those Ray-Ban sunglasses because he's so cool that he wears the aviators. No, he wears the aviators so you can't see how dilated his pupils are because he's shot up with Ritalin or God knows what, what kind of fentanyl-laced cocktail that keeps him up and around. For a speech like this, look at those eyes. Look at the cold, dead, drugged up eyes. His brain is shot. And now watch him 
maneuver what should be one of the easiest things a human being ever has to do. Walk off a stage. Here he goes. Hold your breath, everybody. He has no idea where he is. He has no idea where he is. He has no idea where he's been, and he has no idea where he's supposed to go. But listen, none of that really matters ultimately. What matters is the people of Pennsylvania, the people of Scranton, the people who are struggling right now with the economy there, uh, in the steel industry and what have you. So NBC News wanted to find out what the voters are really thinking about. So let's see how Joe Biden's message resonated with the good people of Scranton and the people who work in the steel industry in central Pennsylvania. In Scranton, Trump supporter John Vasiliga is building a new restaurant and he's slamming President Biden for rising costs. He says his policies are better for, for middle America or anybody. Just walk around and ask the real people. They'll tell you the exact opposite. Oh, well, now hold on. That's not fair. That's just that one guy's a restaurant owner, so he's probably a a fascist capitalist pig. He doesn't represent the real people. So let's go to the streets. Let's just see how the turnout was with the regular people of Scranton coming out to see the president's motorcade. People love him. Didn't you hear that? I mean, they got the name wrong. They were all cheering. Let's go, Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. It's, it's Biden, guys. That was that was let's go, Brandon, wasn't it? I couldn't make out all the words. And thank you. That one very vociferous gentleman there who was saying, you're number one. He kept saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right? I think that's what they were saying. I feel like I work at NPR all of a sudden the way I'm spinning this. Remember how I mentioned he wears the aviators everywhere so you can don't see the dead, dilated pupils in his eyes? Well, they made an impromptu, not very impromptu, stage stop at a Sheets because nothing says Central Pennsylvania like a Sheets. I like Sheets, actually. I go, what do you like better, Sheets or Wawa? Kevin, you got you, you to gotta chime in on this. That's like the big, it's like a, a Whataburger versus In-N-Out. And of course, the answer is In-N-Out. But what about Sheets or Wawa? What do you like? Well, as a native Virginia boy, I feel obliged to say sheets, but I know you Maryland people, you more New England folks like your Wawa. I'm not a New England folk. Wait, Maryland is not New England. And also anything, I'm a anything man. north of DC. All right. Well, I, I do. I actually, I like sheets too. I think sheets has the better food, to be honest with you. So I'm going with sheets there. Happy now? You, you, you rebel, you confederate. All Whoa. right, so he, st he stops at his sheets and take a look. Of course, he keeps the Ray-Bans on inside. But watch the overwhelming response of the people there inside the sheets. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, it's just too painful. 
it is too terrifyingly painful. Did anybody even care? You had one person trying to get a picture with him. Did you see him as he approached the little girls there? And it was almost like his inner monologue. You know, somebody's told him, Joe, you got to stay away from the little girls at these things. It's just really creeping everybody out. Watch him approach the little girl. Oh, look how excited he is. And then the voice in his head, don't do it, Joe. You'll get in trouble. Don't. Nope, stop. Don't. All right, I'll move on. All right, I'll move on. Oh, and look, here's some 14-year-old girls. I don't, don't look at them. Just keep walking. Just keep walking. I think one of those Secret Service guys, his whole job is to keep him from going after the girls. Can we just quickly juxtapose that against last week's visit by Donald Trump at a Chick-fil-A? Uh -huh. This is Morgan, man. This is Solomon. This is Morehouse. This is more than the office. I don't care what the media tells you. This is Trump. Morgan, man. This is Morgan, man. This is Morgan, man. Okay, 4 p.m. We do 4 p.m. Come here. Let me give you a hug. Please. 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 Kind of a different scene there from when Joe Biden walks into a uh, walks into a sheets. The people love him. By the way, we're not the only ones to notice there's a slight difference between how just regular people are greeting Joe Biden versus how they're greeting Donald Trump. Didn't take the Trump campaign long to create this video ad. Crowds gather in upper Manhattan as former President Trump visits a bodega. So this is the moment Mr. Trump arrived tonight. People lined up along 139th and Broadway as he made his way inside the Hamilton Heights bodega to meet with Jose Alba. Alba is the bodega worker who fatally stabbed the man in July of 2022 in a case of self-defense. On Tuesday, he used a Harlem bodega as a backdrop to slam Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg for being what he calls soft on crimes that matter. Without a doubt, very much supported here in Harlem. I, I really appreciate the sound of the 1200 baud modem dialing up there too. It's it's a nice little touch. Well done. Well done, Team Trump. 